Hi, everybody. I'm Scott, and welcome, and thanks again for joining us for another edition of the podcast accompanying the documentary film Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. Today, I'm joined again by one of the producers of the film, Larry Becker, because Larry Becker and I spend too much time BSing on the phone and telling stories offline of the film and these podcasts, and so we said we better go on and share some of these, at least the ones that we feel comfortable sharing, and um, go from there. So this will be a little different uh, podcast than what we've been doing lately. It's going to be mostly battle stories, and whether you worked at Evans or you didn't, I think you'll appreciate some of these. So, all right, so I've got a list. Let me start. Let's have you start, and we'll go um, We'll go a little light, and we'll get juicier as we go along, okay? So you were stationed in Hong Kong for quite a bit, so tell us a Hong Kong story. Well, so probably the best one I could tell you was when the Evans buyer made, you know, one of their annual visits disrupted my life for a week and and uh you know we were we were saying our goodbyes we had a successful trip we were saying our goodbyes we we had dinner together i left them at the shangri-la hotel and they were supposed to be on a flight like seven o'clock the next morning and i get home celebrating you know they're gone it's like, you know, now I could relax. No, yeah, that was, that was, what those trips was when they went home. It was a joy. It was great to have them and great to have them leave. Exactly. exactly. So I get home and I don't think it was hour later. I get a call from Sharon, Sharon Best, and she advised me that they were going to extend their trip for a few And she asked me to join the group, Angry Law, the following morning about breakfast. I get to the meeting, and the first thing they did was the first thing she did was make me sign an NDA. I said, okay, I signed it. So, wait, wait so what, what goes through your, I mean, this is out of the ordinary. So, what are you thinking? Honestly, I had no idea. You know, I mean, I was just, a little puzzled that they were still there. And again, at that point, I was not an Evans employee. I was, you know, I owned PBS at the time. And, you know, I worked as their exclusive agent. Needless to say, I signed the NDA, and they announced to me that they just signed an agreement with Bloomingdale's and Saks with them over the leases. And I mean, it was a beautiful thing. Three day extension added about $2 million to the. Well, wow. and I mean, the reason that they made me sign the NDA was because it was not made public. And since we were a public company, you know, I, I also could not purchase any stock for like 10 days. I had to make the announcement. We, you know, when, when I loved to see them leave, understanding what was going on the next three days, I was happy. You know, on that, on that stock thing, this is even on my list, but you just made me think of it. So my grandfather, decades ago, you know, like in the 50s, he and A.L. and Herman had dinner with Joan Crawford and her either second or third husband, who at the time was the CEO of Pepsi. And... Speaking of this stock thing, back when you didn't go to jail for doing shit like this, he said to them, if you have an extra $10,000, put it into Pepsi because we're going to take on Coke and it's going to be the next big thing. And lo and behold, they all made good money off of Pepsi. So They didn't have to sew it in. Well, that's the TA, right. So, okay, I'll give you one of mine. Um, all right, so... Um, uh, I, I think we've spoken in the documentary, and then you and I even spoke on, on our last uh, uh, podcast here about dealing with uh, my cousin David, who is the CEO of the company. And, um, you know, again, as we talk about in the film, it was very different for the people who, who worked for him versus family. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? 
There were two Evans firs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They lived the American dream, and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. Like they created something out of whole cloth and he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. Well, you know, we were kids back then. We were in our 20s and, uh, and it was the 80s. And we all wanted to be Don Johnson from Miami Vice. And I used to come into work every day with a five o'clock shadow. You know, I shaved every other day or whatever it was. And I also had a couple of earrings at the time, which I think was more like Tubbs than Crockett. And David Walter on a daily basis, if not more than one time a day, would say to me in passing or in a meeting or whatnot, what are you trying to do? Be like Don Johnson? And well. I, I had something similar when I was asked to go to Robbins. David, no, it sat me down and said, Robbins, the chairman uh, or the president, Michael Gould, he will not allow a beard. You know, they're very conservative and he, he won't allow you to have a beard. So would you be willing to shave the beard? And I, you know, I was 23 years old. At first I thought, no, I love this thing. And then I thought, oh, absolutely. I will shave my beard to have this opportunity. So well, I had my meet and greet with Mike Poole. And David actually made me feel a little uncomfortable thinking like, I really wasn't a conservative kind of guy. I was a 23 year old kid. And I walk into the office and his secretary had me seated. And she says, Mr. Gould is ready to see you. And I get up, the first thing I see, he's got a full beard. You know, it was like, it was like, okay. It's cool. I, I asked him, I says, so it's okay to have facial hair, uh, facial hair, at, you know, working at Robinson's? And he went, yeah. So, so I went back and I told David, good news. You don't have to shave my beard. Uh, and he was like a little, a little put off by it, but I never did shave my beard. All right, well, while we're on the topic of L.A. and Beverly Hills, let's talk celebrities for a second. So, okay, I'll because I'll go first. Uh, I'll give my celebrity story. So, Diane Jones, who we both know and love, uh, she was a, a sales gal in the uh, the, the greeter on the third floor of the first salon in Chicago. Oh. Amazing woman. She's like four foot eleven, but, you know, the strongest little mf -er you wouldn't want to screw with. She actually... Um, adopted my dad's dog. When he left Chicago to go to New York, 
he was moving from a big house, an apartment, and wasn't able. Yeah, he 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 didn't want to take the dog. He didn't want to subject the dog to you know life in an apartment. And adopted the dog. He's sort of a family. I love that, and I love Diane. She's great. So anyway, so uh, you know. She had, she was a, this is a gal who had her thumb on the pulse of her community and, you know, and the African-American community in Chicago and whatnot, all the way up to the higher-ups and celebs. And as we just talked about before, I replaced you in L.A. as uh, Larry Freeman's assistant. So um, while I uh, was in that position, I get a call from her in Chicago one day telling me, we've just made a very fine and expensive mink coat for Mr. T. And I'm going to fly out there with the coat. And you and I are going to take it up to uh, the ranch. That's a, that's just when you get past Thousand Oaks. I forget the name of it now. Um, and we're going to take it up to the ranch and deliver the coat to him and make sure everything's okay. I was like, great. And you know, very exciting. So she gets there. First of all, the coat is ginormous. I mean, if Mr. T was, he wasn't the tallest guy, but he was amongst the widest. Well, he liked to wear them down to the floor. He bought a few coats in Chicago. Remember, the skunk coats. Now, it, it was mink coats. He put two of them. One was ranch mink with a white skunk stripe, and the other one was a white mink black uh, skunk stripe. This is the white one. So she comes out, and we go up. We drive up to this ranch, and, um, you know, when they're done shooting, he brings us into his trailer and everything. It's very nice, very cordial. And Diane, from clearly, you know, uh, uh, friends from, from uh, Chicago and whatnot, and we take the coat out, we're trying on the coat, and all of a sudden, this motorcycle rev comes roaring up the hill, and the thing stops in front of the thing, dust kicks up, and Hulk Hogan gets off of his bike. And uh, he walks in, and he starts laughing <laughs> at Mr. T trying on this mink coat. And, 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 you know, again, like the cordial friends that they were, and I'll never forget this. Mr. T turns to Hulk Hogan and looks at me and looks at Diane and he goes, let me introduce you to my furriers. <laughs> yeah, it was just something about it that oh, stuck with me forever. And, um, you know, and I, I hold that moment dear in my heart. So, Absolutely. All right, let's hear a celebrity story from your time in L.A. Or not, or outside of L.A. even. Well, actually, L.A. provided a few really cool can I tell you more than one? Sure. Start with one. Let's start with one and laugh it out, and then we'll go to the next one. So, so probably my favorite was Roseanne Barr. Roseanne Barr did a series of commercials, like three or four TV commercials for. She was at the start of her career. Actually, was she was not. She was not a well-known, you know, comedy. She. She was actually a stand-up comedian at that point. He had, and she was becoming well known, but she didn't have the TV shows or TV exposure or anything like that. So, in a I'm flashing the uh, article on the screen behind us, but she, but at the time, the our ad agency wanted somebody like her to try and connect more to the working house yard and and younger people, and and it was the first time that we ever developed. A sense of humor our advertising. It was always urgency. You know what I mean? Now it was humor. And I mean, I think it worked quite well. Um, but the point was that I don't know if it was Robert, it was probably Robert who negotiated a barter. And, and it, it was surprising because, again, she was just starting out. So we offered, or Robert offered her a Sable in lieu of payment, uh, you know, of, of a monetary payment for her to, you know, to star in these three or four commercials. And, and for, the, for those that don't know back then, a, a moderately priced Sable code is what, 50 grand, right? It, it, it's exactly what the actual cost of this. But, but I do believe, not the cost, the retail, but what I do believe was that. That was the amount of money that she would have received. So we got a really good deal. All right, but so now, tell us about going to meet her and everything, because this is before. Okay, so, so 
So now I, I lived in West Hollywood. She lived in West Hollywood. And I invited her to come to the store because I, I had to custom make it for her. You know, we, we had to custom. We had to take the measurements, select the style with her. And I even brought bundles of skins for her to make a selection. And, you know, we're, we're sitting in, I'm sitting in, in her house. And I don't know, I was always a bit starstruck. You know, when I, when I would see, you know, we were living in L.A. And you'd see stars every day. And weird how they would just walk into the Beverly Hills store. I mean, they're just like nonchalantly. Well, nothing, you know, not for nothing. Robinson's was the carriage trade store in Beverly Hills. So, I mean, it was, you know, the, the finest, the wealthiest, the, you know, all the celebrities. that In those days, in the 80s, celebrities shopped for themselves. They didn't have... Only the style, you know, the last 25 years I was, in, I never saw a celebrity. It was only had access to the actual celebrity. I spent a good half in her house. And hey, so you can come into the store? She, she asked if I would come to her. I said, where, where do you live? And I figured she lived in Beverly Hills. She said, I live in West Hollywood. I literally lived. Five minutes. So I made it, you know, I made an appointment that after work, I'm going to come to her. And I tell you, it was probably 20 minutes before we even got into the house. We were sitting on the, and she was just telling jokes. And I was just cracking up. It was like, this was better than, you know, the annual bonus I used to. Well, no. <laughs> it was pretty good. Anyway, it was, um, we built a little bit of a friendship because she was very much into sticks and I knew of this famous psychic that I actually put her in touch with and she used to call me. You know, she literally would call me, keep contact with me after and you know, it was like, to me, it was like I made a friend with a celebrity. But again, I, I find myself sometimes a little starched. And this was just very easy. Which will lead me into another. Yeah, let's hear that. So remember at Robinson's on the fifth floor, they had the cafe? Yeah. So, so one day, David Brenner, who certainly was my favorite comedian time. You know, I, I, I just, I love he was doing a book signing. He had a, a book that he wrote, Soft Pretzels with Mustard. And he was doing a book signing Robinson. And it was time for me to have my lunch. I went up to the cafe. And I see him sitting at a table by himself. I grabbed my lunch, and I just came over to him. said to him, Mr. Brenner, I, I got to tell you, you are just favorite comedian in the world. Remember as a little kid, you know, like be on, on Johnny Carson, whatever show, and my whole family would sit around and, and watch, you know, and be entertained by you. And he was like the only comedian that didn't use vulgarity, you know, foul language. It was all just real, you know, real happens. And he just made fun of. It was great. And he said, to, he was sitting and eating his lunch. I mean, he literally stopped to talk to me. And he said to me, would you like this? So I sat down. I had my lunch. I don't think I ate any of it. It was just listening and talking with him. And it just, I mean, it was exciting. And I explained, you know, um, they worked the you know, bird apartment. And, you know, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe you bring home a uh, present for your wife. And, and, you know, I mean, we, we sat there for another 10, 15 minutes and I get back to work, go back to work. And probably around four o'clock that day, into the first floor. And I happened to be in my office, but he asked and I come out of the office and he's standing there and he had a copy of the book, which he, you know, autographed, personally autographed, you know, to me. 
And it was like another victory for Larry. You know, it was it was exciting. I'll tell you one more. Go for it. Yeah. There was a victory. So let me, before you tell that, you know, I, I didn't appreciate this at the time, but when I was a teenager and I would go and visit my grandparents in Florida, they always thought it was a big deal to take us to a show. You know, Sunrise Theater was new at the time, and there were shows at the Doral and all, you know. And so I saw Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis and Tony Benn and all the greats growing up, and they always had a comedian opening for them. So I saw David Brenner and Alan King and Robert Klein and all those people. And right. I'm excited. I didn't appreciate it at the time. But now I look back on it and go, boy, how lucky I was, huh? Yeah, exactly. You know what? That's a great way of putting it. We were very lucky to have the exposure to things that are really out of the norm. I mean, we were just there to do our job, and these things sort of fell in our way. I'm going to tell you the best. Let's hear. So, so I was in the Beverly Hills store, and Robinson's, we didn't run a lot of sales. So it was in walks one of the prettiest girls, Charlene Tilden. She was an actress, a young actress. We were the same age. She was like 23 or 24 what, years that's old. What, Kimberly or Dallas or something? Dallas. She was, she was like the niece on Dallas. And she comes in, she was interested in a mink coat. She comes in and she sees all the people. She said, is there any way that you have, is, is there anything like a private area dressing room or something that you have? I don't want to be in front of all of these people. We didn't have dressing. I mean, we didn't have a private dress. I said, you're welcome to use my office. So she appreciated that. And I went and I selected a few things. You know, we spoke for a while. I selected a few things for her. I bring it into the office. And she says, can I have a little bit of privacy? I said, absolutely. I says, you just let me know, you know, when you, when you need or want my help. Anyway, she's in there for about 15 minutes. And she opens up the door just a little. And she says, can you come in here? I want your opinion. And I said, yeah, sure. And I can't, I walk in wearing this gorgeous nope. full length. You don't even tell me. Go ahead. Just the bra and panty. Now I'm like, why didn't she select the jacket? She actually bought the coat. I mean, she says, what do you think? I was like, ha, 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 I'm going to help. Oh, that's great. All right, how about along those lines, how about humbling moments, okay? Here, I'll give you, I'll give you a simple one. Um, and again, this is the kind of thing you learn when you're, when you're young, right? So they sent me out to Fresno to cover one of these sales. And Fresno is not L.A. It's not San Francisco, and it's not San Diego. It's not even San Fermento. <laughs> and, um, however, what was the store we had that got jocks? We did a lot of business there. Yes. So anyway, from there of this sale, just helping out selling over the weekend. And, um, you know, they were working in up system. So my, my turn came up to take the next customer. And this couple walks in in their 50s, dirt all over them. Uh, the man was in overalls. Like I said, filthy, dirty. The wife looked like she'd either been in the garden or helping him plow or something. And I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be an utter waste of my talk to him. He turns to her on the way in, which then made me think even more this is going to be a waste of my time. He goes, get whatever you want, honey, but keep it under 50. And she spent $48,000. And I, that was the day, the day I learned my lesson about not judging a book by its cover, boy. That is, that is. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when Brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. All I know is that he had a photographic memory, he was brilliant, and the family loved him. 
Yeah, I think she loved the way I looked, so she was always, you know, like I was her little doll. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got hurt. It was just a bad thing. He's with this dinosaur, you know, a toy dinosaur on the table, and he says, you know what happened to these dinosaurs? It was a, a, a very unique era. Jeff and I got some calls, and people were just sobbing. Well, they shut the doors on people. That was pretty high profile. A fish has got to swim and an eagle's got to soar. That's their natural temperament and how they want to live and how they want to play. And when that's blocked, people are really unhappy. Okay, you, you want something humbling? I mean, I was in, in Southland. And as part of my training program. So South Lake for beef foods, that's, we're talking about northern Indiana, Merrillville. Are you, okay. Yes. It's the, I'm living in the loop of Chicago. And I got to drive every day to South Lake Mall in Merrillville, Indiana. It was, it was not only a culture shock, but it was a real hassle. I just hoped that it was going to be over soon. Anyway. One night, and I was working the, the iron days, you know, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the store. And it was just like repeat. Every day, I would drive two hours, you know, be there at 9. I'd leave at 9. I'd be home at 11. And I'd repeat it every day, six days a week. Anyway, one night, a woman comes in telling me a story about Husband passed away. All she wanted, all he ever wanted to give in life, what? A fur coat. You know, a gift of a fur coat. And I, I don't think this woman was any older than maybe four years old. That's lost her husband. And all I can tell you is she, you know, she she made such you know, such impact on me where she was saying, you know, I really can't afford it. You know, wanted me to have this and tribute to him. I'm going to get a fur coat. We start talking. She, she had a dog. Or at least she told her. It's her. We ended up, what we, what we ended up with was, if you remember, I think it was style 75 tank. It was blue fox. Remember the blue fox hair around coat? It was a full length coat that you could zip off to be a three quarter. Then you could zip it off to be a jacket. Somehow you could zip the fucking thing off and be a hat. I don't know. What to do. And I think if I remember, we had them on sale $999. So it was supposedly within her price range. However, she didn't have money for that night. And I said to her, you know, we do offer, you know, a credit program. And I said, you know, all you have to do is fill out this application. I'll have an answer, you know, in, in 10 minutes. Fills out the application. I send it to Frank Harrington. And five minutes later, he said, you know, it's like one, two, three. Everything is good. She was so Excited, so happy. 
And I says to her, you know, I want you to pick out a monogram. We'll embroider, you know, we'll embroider the coat. That really makes it yours. And she says, can I have something else, not just my name? And I said, yeah, write it down what you want, and, you know, I'll do my best to do it. She wrote a whole story about how her husband, you know, from husband to her, and, you know, telling the story. And I was truly, I mean, it brought, literally brought tears to me. I said, we're going to do it. I ended up, we ended up monogramming the coat. It was like literally a whole half, coat, you know, with the story. Anyway, tell her, you know, I'll have that back, send it to Chicago. It came back. Have it back probably within a week. And when I got it back, I called her. She came in. She cried. I cried. It was just a beautiful thing. She leaves with the coat. Oh, but she asked me if I could have a gift wrap. She leaves with the gift wrap. A month later, month and a half later, all caring, telling me the woman was no good. And she's not paying the bill. And, you know, it was like, gave some fraudulent information, this and that. And, what do we do? He says, you're going to have to go and get the coat. And I said, what? <laughs> you approved it. I'm not secure. It's shit up. And I, I mean, I agreed to get the coat. And she lived in, in Sheriff, which was like the next town. I went there. And she actually lived at her mom's address. I go there unannounced. On the door, mother, Indiana. I said, You. Oh, she says, Yeah, I've been waiting. And it was almost like, it was almost like, Oh, so, you know, she says, well, My daughter has a problem. It was all bullshit. Uh, well, her story was, Yeah. But she had a mental, you know, <laughs> about the husband. It's a modern story. is all, oh, he's a good story. I'm waiting for the movie, you know? And he, and I cried over it. Anyway, anyway, the mother says, we've been waiting for you. I've been waiting. He said, he'll give you back. Okay. She brought it out. Mother brought it. I never saw the door. The mother brought the coat out. It was still in the gift wrap box. Several. So I got that coat back and I thought to myself, that, you know, the story was really a sad story, but it was sadder that this woman had that problem. Right, right. That actually included me because Frank Harrington said to me, I'm the one that author. And if she doesn't pay or I don't get the coat back, I'm going to be with So. I did get the coat back, but it truly, it, it truly was a humble. It just made me, it made me look at every person that I did business with after that and just try and see if I could penetrate with my eyes. They're my, I've never had anybody else that could do it.